So what I will be talking to you about today stems from an article that my friend and colleague Girish Punjabi and I wrote a few months ago. Now while each one of us have felt or continue to feel the need to reshape the state of environmental affairs in our surroundings, planting trees is a common choice that is made in this direction. It, I mean, it is something that can be done easily and gives us a, gives us a sense of having done something for the environment and contributed something in the, towards the environment in some way. India plants 66 million trees in 12 hours as part of a record-breaking re record environmental campaign. If you look at what's coming out in our national news, we have Maharashtra that is looking to launch a 50 crore tree plantation drive, whereas in Tamil Nadu, 68 lakh saplings have been planted since last year. And if you kind of look at what's happening in Pune, we have the state government, we have the PMC, we have NGOs and citizens like you and me, who are also engaging in similar plantations across the city, in and around the city. So what, we re so what I really want you to think about it, what, what really drives or motivates us in engaging in these tree plantations in the first place? It's probably some sort of an offsetting, offsetting process so as to compensate for historical or current losses that happen in forest cover across the country. Is it really to combat climate change? to sequester carbon dioxide, to conserve biodiversity that is present in and around our surroundings, or to provide livelihoods for the local people and to alleviate poverty in these areas. But given that we know all of this, um, tree plantation drives really do seem like extremely well-intentioned and need-of-the-hour solutions. So what is the other side of this? This is a headline from this year, nine months after record plantation drive, very few standing. We watered saplings for three months only. The saplings were small and could not survive owing to the rocky land. This is the second headlines which is coming out from the Maharashtra Forest Department. 89% of the 10-year-old plantations are unsuccessful. The evaluation report blamed improper site selection, wrong species, poor planting stock, poor protection, and lack of involvement of local people as some of the major reasons for the failure. This report also stated that close to four and a half crores of public money were wasted in this direction. So this is it. The decision-making process behind these tree plantation drives seem to be ignoring some of the most important and obvious considerations, I would think. The what, the where, the when, and the why. What is, what are the tree species that are being planted? Where should we be planting them? When is the best time to undertake these tree plantations? And why is it that we're planting trees in the first place? Is it to conserve biodiversity? Is it to just green spaces? Or is it really to, to combat climate change in some way? An even bigger problem is this. Um, okay. So if you look at this continuous tract of forest, this other side, sorry for the bad resolution of the picture, this bit is deforested. It's been completely logged. And so this patch of land can be considered as a degraded or a deforested patch. Now, if you know what kind of tree species that exist in this patch, this piece of land can be restored, given that we have this knowledge. Now, if you look at this landscape, it looks nothing like the forest that I just showed you before this. Now, it's very likely that the, landscape, that the climatic conditions in these landscapes naturally support fewer trees. Can we really call this a d as a degraded or a deforested landscape? Probably not. So there is a difference between planting trees on deforested or degraded pieces of land as compared to planting trees where they did not occur historically, at least not at very, very high densities. So there is a difference between what we call reforestation and restoration as compared to afforestation. And this disregard of sorts is, is a fairly widely occurring problem. For instance, the World Resources Institute um, published a map about two or three years ago and marked out areas all across the world that had the potential to be forested. A year later, another study which looked at these marked out areas very, very carefully uh, figured out that about nine million square kilometers of these areas were erroneously considered as deforested or degraded landscapes. And most of these happened to be grass-dominated ecosystems. In the Indian context, we have the Green India Mission that was launched in 2014. This was mainly to 
uh, protect and enhance the forest cover in, in, in India, but along with that also to provide for a whole range of ecosystem services. And these include things like biodiversity, water, to provide firewood fuel for the local people. So the plan is to restore and afforest about 5 million hectares of forested and non-forested lands. And these non-forested lands often include grasslands, open scrublands, so on and so forth. So what I'm trying to tell you is that these grass-dominated landscapes are very often the common targets for these sort of plantation drives. And these are often categorized as waste pieces of land by the Indian government. There is mounting evidence now to show that these are extremely unique and fragile ecosystems which support a whole range of biodiversity and provide for a whole variety of ecosystem services. So in the next few slides, I will be taking you through three of the grass-dominated landscapes that we have in India. Some of, the, some of these are, are, are seen very, very close to Pune as well. These are mixed tree and grass ecosystems, also called as savannas. And very often when we think of savannas, our minds are transported to these vast grassy plains in Africa. But the fact is that we have savannas here in India as well, some in and very, very close to Pune as well. Now these are characterized by a continuous these are characterized by a continuous layer of grasses interspersed with trees at very, very, at, at different and varying densities. These, all these ecosystems are maintained by um, climatic conditions like rainfall, as well as biotic factors such as grazing by wild and domestic herbivores, as well as fire. So what's really happening to these landscapes? These are being transformed to a very, very large extent um, and made more and more homogeneous by planting trees that possibly don't even belong to these sort of areas. And this is probably because uh, these sort of lands do not fit the forested landscape picture that most of us imagine. The next one uh, is the lateritic and basaltic outcrops, and a good example of this is Kaas. Um, these landscapes appear extremely barren, as you can see in the photos up here, in the summer months. But come monsoon, these areas are completely transformed. Just look at how beautiful this place looks. These get dominated by grass and herb species. And the thing is, these landscapes are naturally devoid of large trees and have a very thin soil layer. So the plants that do come up here, are sort of, they have sort of evolved to tolerate these thin soil layers and poor nutrient conditions of the soil. There are reports that these sort of landscapes are being converted into monoculture plantations of wattle and bamboo. The third are the high elevation grasslands that, that are seen in the southern part of the western ghats of India. These grasslands are associated with these forests called the Shola forests. And there are paleoecological evidences which show that these grasslands or these mosaic of sholas and grasslands have existed for many, many years altogether, even before humans came into this landscape. These are also being transformed by monoculture plantations of tree species like pine, eucalyptus, wattle, all of which were introduced to these landscape by the British. So what is it that's happening to these plantations and what are they doing in these landscapes? Let's try and look at lessons from India and some other case studies from across the world. Now, there's a study from North China which shows that a decade-long afforestation project that was undertaken between, 2000, between 1995 and 2005, which basically led to a whole range of trees that were not locally or not present in the vicinity, these non-native trees that were being planted in these areas. Um, after 10 years, 70% of these trees died. And it is hypothesized that these trees were probably unable to survive long periods of frequent droughts that these, that these landscapes inherently experience. The other example is of a 10-year plantation that was undertaken by the Maharashtra Forest Department between 2004 and 2014. And this led to about 74% of the trees completely dying out. There are hydrological consequences as well. Um, so trees in general have greater nutrient and water demands as compared to the grasses that are growing in the understory. They also have a much deeper soil, soil profile as compared to grasses which have roots that probably go up to a few centimeters deep. 
Now, when these grass dominated landscapes are planted with a lot of trees, these have effects on the water table. So, for instance, the, chi the Northern China study that I talked to you about, they found that the groundwater depth increased just after the tree plantation drive. So, 10 years after the tree plantation drive, the, the groundwater depth increased by about 30 meters. This basically means, I mean, if I had to explain this in really lay terms, if I had to dig a well, before the tree plantation drive, I could probably find water at, say, 5 meter depth. But now, 10 years after the tree plantation drive, I would have to sort of bore down 30 meters below or 35 meters below to go find water. And you can imagine in arid landscapes, these, these sort of things can have really adverse effects. The next example comes from the grassland and shola landscapes that I talked to you about earlier, and I showed you some photos from there. When it rains, otherwise the water that sort of trickles down and goes and joins the streams and the rivers was now trapped by these monoculture plantations and all the water sort of was picked up by the trees and there was that basically led to a decrease in the outflow from the plantation areas and this in turn had changes in the stream flow. There are consequences for biodiversity as well. If you look at the picture on the top, this is a diverse, um, this is a diverse species rich grassland ecosystem. Now you go and plant trees on them. A lot of these, this basically planting these trees induces shade. A lot of these tree, uh, grass species are not used to these shaded environments. So only those grass species that can tolerate shade to a certain extent survive. And this probably in the long run may end up being species that are not particularly ideal or useful to the wildlife or the herbivores that are there in that system. The other example comes from the Valmiki Tiger Reserve. Um, here, there was a monoculture plantation that was undertaken in the 1960s and 70s. These species of black buck that were present in these otherwise vast patches of grassland went locally extinct a few years after these monoculture plantations took over. So we have loss of understory um, grass species, and we also have local extinction of important wildlife. So to quickly summarize um, a whole range of things that I've told you right now, grass-dominated landscapes are the usual targets for these sort of free plantation drives. The what, the where, the why, and how much are important considerations that go widely unacknowledged. There is a huge difference between reforestation and afforestation. Now, afforestation drives tend to use species that are not particularly native to that very area that we are looking at. They end up using exotic species that are not found in those areas or when indigenous species are used, they are planted at extremely high densities. There is, there, there is increasingly evidence that is gathering to show that some of these plantations are highly unsuccessful, which, which in turn leads to a huge waste of public money. And there are consequences for biodiversity as well as the hydrology of the landscape. To be very, very clear at this point, this is not at all to say that planting trees is bad completely and we shouldn't go around doing this at all. Uh, there's a lot of value, addi value addition in areas where land use change and human-induced land use change has already occurred. For instance, in urban spaces, along roadsides, etc. Completely deforested landscapes can also be restored in some way or the other, or to a certain extent, planting trees. But where planting trees is absolutely essential, um, it makes complete sense to clearly identify the goal of the plantation. So why is it that we're planting trees in the first place? And once we have the, an answer to that sort of a question, the next step would be to identify trees that are locally um, native to that area that, that, that is being considered for tree plantation. This makes sense because those tree species are probably more adapted to the environment um, that, that the landscape sort of, um, the landscape has. And those tree species are probably even more relevant to the native flora and fauna and the local people that use the landscape much more frequently than any of us. With this, I'd like to end. If you have any questions, and I don't know if I have the time for questions, okay, not, at some point later. But if you do have any questions, you can email me. Thank you. <laughs>